Um, Paddy Gibson, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you. Thank you. I was expecting you to do the uh, the intro. Highly healthy podcast, right? Up. I usually do it before, technically, but I suppose we're just kind of oh, slip it it's in. Weird the magic for me now. <laughs> yeah, well, this is all <laughs> behind the scenes. Damn. I try and look professional. Um, <laughs> but how's things? How are you, man? I, I we've been having so much crack. I forgot to even ask. I know. I'm good. I'm good. I uh, I'm trying to think what's been going on. We were just. Um, I was just telling you how much I love the podcast, but uh, sure. where am I? Yeah, I've, I've moved into a new uh, a new apartment, which um, turns out was the biggest nightmare I've ever experienced. Moving house is, uh, yeah, <laughs> is not good. Such, <laughs> such a pain in the ass, but I'm here. I'm very, very happy to be uh, in a new space. I'm living, living on my own for the first time, which is um, sick. And were you definitely. emigrating as well or moving like somewhere kind of far away? Yeah, well, I can't, I moved... I like emigrated as far across to the other side of London as I possibly could. Um, yeah. But I was uh, I was in Australia then for for the last few months. So Sick. that's yeah for I think four months, five months. I suppose um, with the acting, you probably have to kind of travel around a lot, do you? Are you kind of set dependent where you got to go? Yeah, where the yeah, work is a little bit. Pretty much, you end up in some in some mad places. Australia was definitely. Uh, mm. One of the one of the better ones. <laughs> really? <laughs> Usually, yeah. You're like, oh, you're going to Scunthorpe for four Woo! months. <laughs> you're gonna have to, yeah, live in a trailer for the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what were you doing in Australia? Was there a particular production or movie you were? Yeah, on? I was do. I was doing a. Um, it's this mad. It's like a fantasy adventure comedy film. Yeah. Um, the Henson Company. I don't know if you know them. They mm. they did like Labyrinth and those kind of iconic like eighties and nineties movies. Jim Henson, the guy, yeah, the puppeteer, yeah, kind exactly. Of, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, he's pretty. Um, who I was, I was also a mad fan of. I think I watched a documentary when I was younger mm -hmm. about the creature shop and how they like come up with all the all the different creatures and stuff. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it's like basically Harry Potter mixed with The Office. Um, what? The UK one. It's just like weird. I know. It's, no. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> I was definitely the elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, no, it's man, it's absolutely nuts. Um, and uh, Christoph Waltz plays like my boss, um, who I know I can't give away any spoilers. Um, this is is it called the, the portable door, the passable door? Yeah, 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 yeah the portable door. Um, mm. So and then Sam Neil plays like my my man. I was going to ask you, man. I saw complete asshole to I me. saw a photo. I was like, "That's the guy from Jurassic Park." Holy yes. shit! Oh my man, god! Such a legend, an man, absolute. My girlfriend yeah. would actually cry. She literally watches Jurassic Park every week religiously. <laughs> it's like <laughs> no her way. favorite movie of all time. Oh my god! And I was like, no. "Listen, Patty might know." God, all right, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see. Like, put in a word. Yeah. <laughs> but he was great. He, uh, I remember we had this like, at a scene where we had to do a kiss, and I don't even know why he was about. I don't. Yeah, I don't know why he was there on set. He was not in the scene. He had nothing to do with it. I think he just he just wanted to wanted to either make me feel intimidated or see see what the what the skills were saying. And he came up uh, after like the first take, and he was like. You know, when I did my kiss with Laura Dunn, um, the way I did it was... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. What? <laughs> to be fair, you're like, he did have some in, good tips. In Jurassic but... <laughs> Park. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, not great for the confidence, but thanks, Sam. <laughs> That's man, top tips. Like, do you ever get yeah. starstruck in situations like that? You're probably moving with, like, some really interesting crowds and meeting so many people. Like, how do you feel about it? Yeah, you, I mean, I do. It's, but then it's always like weird, weird people that I'll be starstruck by that nobody else really cares about. But yeah, because they're cool to really you. Like, yeah, hmm. yeah, but definitely, uh, I, I find more when, like, going into the first scene or like the first day of yeah. a scene with somebody um, of like, yeah, of a certain caliber. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I, I just always, I was like, fuck, I'm gonna. I'm going to end up, because it's such a collaborative process yeah. that when you're working with people who are, I mean, by definition, just far leagues ahead of you, sometimes you feel a bit stupid, like trying to collaborate with them, but you know, but yeah. that quickly goes away, mm -hmm. but you just don't want to like step on someone's toes and be like, 
you know, do you want to, uh, when you say that line, should, should <laughs> yeah, do like this or, uh, yeah. I suck at acting, man. Why did I ever Right, do? literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, that's interesting because yeah. it's such an immersive thing with acting. Like I've done some acting classes I did in Belfast for a while just to like try it out to just kind of like get a feel. And I absolutely loved it, man, to be honest. I really found yeah. it so fascinating how you could get so absorbed in it and so like kind of give performances or give like, you know, stuff would come out of you that you didn't even realize was kind of going on yeah. or you could step into stuff. Do you think nerves gets in the way of that? Like, how do you deal with a situation like that where you feel kind of maybe you're not sure? How do you get into it? Definitely. I think that's it's funny. Like, I remember hearing Tom Hanks saying, and this is like recently, yeah. saying that his biggest <laughs> thing was overcoming self-consciousness and nerves and anything like that. I mean, Man. I think we're pre-programmed. As soon as you have a camera put on you, yeah. you become self-conscious and there is definitely i think when you watch somebody who's managed to overcome that and i think there's loads of ways of doing it mm -hmm. and i think trying to tackle self-consciousness itself is almost that's i think that's one of those things that kind of makes it worse or like when you when you try and battle nerves um and i find the same with stuff like anxiety but mm -hmm. if you i feel like shifting your focus yeah. I can't remember who it was who was saying it, but there's a, an acting teacher, maybe Larry Moss, who talks about, I mean, we only have the capacity to focus on a certain amount of things and it's pretty limited. Mm. And if you just fill your mind with the inner imagery that the character would see, say if you're talking about like you hit somebody with your car That's really, and you're telling yeah. that story, mm. if you, rather than focusing on yourself and like, oh shit, I feel nervous. I'm a loser. Like I'm not, I'm not good at <laughs> yeah, this. All, all of those the, things that just like, voices going on. Yeah. <laughs> just that, that uh, occupy the mind most of the time mm -hmm. when you, uh, when you start focusing on like inner imagery and, um, and yeah, like the, the backstory or, um, he talks about like what ifs, which is you'd, you'd replace, say you've never hit somebody with a car, but maybe you could imagine your best friend lying there in the road and any of those things yeah. that then starts to, and it's something kind of actionable. You can be like, mm. now I've got to focus. That, that was something that helped me. Um, but it's funny. It's still like, I, I, my favorite thing about working with people who are experienced as well as you kind of realize that they have all the same shit, like they're, yeah. they're struggling with all the same things, Tom Hanks. which is really comforting. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's like, but that's it's good. like, oh, great. Mm. But also, kind of depressing as well because you're like fuck you haven't gotten over it either like that's interesting <laughs> yeah that it's humans all the way down and you're like oh shit. yeah there's like i really thought somebody would have just like figured this out yeah and it would be fine yeah um, there's, there's a thing that they say like when you uh when the camera turns around and it's on the other person um and you're both kind of having your close-ups mm -hmm. all your best work is when they turn around and <laughs> oh, well, on you. Not <laughs> <laughs> and i was like i've asked him i was like do you guys get that too and he's like Every fucking time. <laughs> Man, you just get, yeah, you're absorbed. Yeah. But that's, I suppose that's kind of the thing about acting as well. There's such a like, you're the focus of it, but also you're kind of part of something larger than yourself a lot of the time. Yeah. It's like, you can't always just be the, I guess, even if you are the star of it in some sense, because you're playing a role maybe as well. It's like the character is something else. Do you find mm -hmm. that like when you're learning about a character, you're getting into them? Is there something that draws you to specific characters? Because like, I suppose writing characters, from my perspective, yeah. they feel like alive to me as a separate kind of entity. So I'm always interested like how actors kind of, you know, change personality in a sense or change like chameleons. Totally. I th yeah. I mean, like what you're saying with, uh, with the writing thing, when it kind of, it's that weird, it's like you tapped into something else that I'm sure yeah. when you read some of your stuff back, you're like, Really? Like, that was me. Like, like this where, shit. Where <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> I thought this was way better than like. Oh, like man, I gotta stop smoking. This yeah, shit is crazy. Like, this is, wow. <laughs> Who did um, this? But yeah, but, I mean, yeah. but when that, I think when that, when that really does happen, like, mm. um, I think with acting, when I read something that someone else has had that experience, you have this weird, like, subconscious. It doesn't happen with every role, but like, yeah. something that uh resonates with you you'll you'll kind of pick up those breadcrumbs that somebody else left mm. and it might not even be in the words it might not be that the character says this is how i see the world or this is how i feel about the world but yeah. something about like the whole thing you kind of when it's well written you mm. you like absorb that 
and uh that's i think that's what's like really exciting about good writing and and stuff like that is it mm-hmm. it's not really uh it's not like you have to create a character you don't mm-hmm. sit down and go like how do i walk how do i talk you kind of just read it enough times and you absorb what's already been put in there and then you add obviously yourself to it as well yeah and that kind of thing that's like the really satisfying that's kind of what you chase and it's not it's not always there um, <laughs> yeah, well i'm sure you're gonna have to work with it while you get a lot of the time <laughs> yeah exactly um, but that's an interesting point i mean the, it kind of what reminded me there or what popped into my head was subtext and the importance of like it was always a transition from going from writing prose to writing plays and screenplays and stuff it was like you don't really have much subtext in prose at all like it's just kind of mm-hmm. i mean it shouldn't be just on the nose but with plays and stuff yeah, I quickly realized that the actors have to have something to grab onto. Like there has to be this kind of undercurrent of something like that's what yeah. the acting is in a sense. And if you, if they don't have that, it's kind of like, you know, there isn't much to work with. Or there isn't really any way. Yeah. What I need, are there any scripts you've worked on that you thought were that kind of grabbed you like that, that had like, you know, you kind of felt that flow or kind of got absorbed into it. Yeah, it's it's weird, and I don't know why. It's it's for some reason it's often been like really fucked up characters <laughs> yeah. that, that happens easier with, and I don't know what that is like. Why yeah. it's but uh, there was there's a couple. I did I did this I did a play that I and I never done a play before. Um, it's it's by this writer Lynn Nottage. I don't know if you've read the play. It's called Sweat. It's Sweat. class play. It's definitely recommend Sick. reading it. Um, it she got I think she won like two Pulitzers. Um, yeah. one for that and something else. Yeah, she's she's unreal. Um, yeah. but something about that, I think that character had like a lot of vulnerability, but then mm-hmm. covered it up. And I think that mm-hmm. that's always like a, been an interesting thing I found both in like reading and, and in, even watching stuff and just yeah. as characters that are uh, find relatable. I think I find that easier than a character who's openly vulnerable, but at the same time, also easier as a character who's just like a, a you know, just kind of a dick or like, <laughs> yeah, just, you know, kind of just a, like a straight up just asshole. A bit of a prick. Like, you're like, who am yeah, I? This? Yeah, oh, I'm a prick. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, that, that character goes from being, it, it's set in a bar in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and uh, his best friend is, um, is like African American and his, his mom is as well. And the guy they're like as close to like brothers as you can be they're so so tight yeah and um and there's uh kind of racial tensions in that bar keep uh kind of getting worse and worse and then eventually um this massive incident happens and then you see both of the characters in the future and uh my guy become like a white supremacist and uh is just like so, like deeply troubled, aggressive, mm-hmm. yeah. um, a complete psycho. Mm. And I think just being able to see that transition and how far somebody can go and just knowing like, if you pass that guy in the street, you'd never know like all of those beautiful conversations they had five or 10 years ago. And you'd yeah, you know, that kind person, of, like, with the ooh, other guy. That's an eerie feeling, isn't it? Like that kind yeah. of, you don't know. And there's something there like playing. So that's kind of a character that's kind of like become evil or become corrupted or has mm-hmm. like, um, and how, when you play a character like that, do you feel like, cause you, I'm thinking of like Heath Ledger and the Joker, maybe that's a bit of a strong example, but, um, yeah. it just feels like you have to kind of go there in a sense. Like you have to feel a bit of, you know, that was something that interested me in the little bit of acting that I did was playing unpalatable characters yeah. that you wouldn't normally play, but then trying to be, it's something about writing that's fascinating as well. You have to kind of do, yeah. give the devil his due. You have to kind of, you know, do it properly but that also is kind of like hey i don't know <laughs> i don't agree with yeah. this but you know no a hundred percent i, I, I think there. you it's weird because it's there's a like a strange catharsis in it and it's for some mm-hmm. reason it's i guess any um extreme form of expression is satisfying like inherently you know even and even yeah. Even really good, like like that ecstasy is like amazing as well. But yeah. and and going to that other extreme of like the darkness, mm-hmm. um, and I think 
I don't know. I feel like I kind of sound like a wanker being like you pay a price for it. But I do I do think in some in some terms like I would understand as, that man to be honest. Yeah. And in the little bit that I did kind of messing around, you could see how it would kind of you have to absorb a lot, I think, to do it. Like you do kind yeah. of have to lose yourself in the role. There was a the a part that I played this year, well, I actually started it pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um we did two weeks in in LA. I was playing like a an Irish meth dealer who falls in love with uh, with this young girl. She's like an underage girl, mm -hmm. and uh, they get a. They're both like heavily addicted to meth. Mm -hmm. It was it was really intense. <laughs> and, uh, we did we did two weeks, and then uh, it's mad, man. Like yeah. I'm getting like beaten up by like three hundred pound like. Rappers with face tattoos and stuff. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> mad. And you're and just I like, this, why would I get myself into this? <laughs> yeah. Well. Really, honestly, I was like, shit, I chose the wrong job, man. <laughs> no, I was like, I'm just a scrawny fella. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going around, going around LA, acting, acting like a madman. Um, but we did two weeks. That was one of the, that was one of those times when it was like, both moments of just like pure elation and and yep. you're so inside of the you know, you're not even thinking about the fact that you're playing a terrible person anymore because that's also kind of something mm. that you have to modulate i think especially in something like that if you ever before the film is finished if you ever start thinking if your own morality and your own judgment mm -hmm. um starts having any bearing on the characters then you're kind of in dangerous territory. And at the same time, if you start thinking what people will think of you or mm -hmm. it, or, you know, if I go this far with it, people might think I'm really like that or like anything like that. I think that's, that's just kind of, kind of a losing any... game, isn't it? Like you can't yeah. really get around that. And there's something really interesting about that. Like it reminded me of Socrates when he said like, everybody thinks, or sorry, it was Aristotle. Everybody thinks they're good. You know, if you right, every, right. if you go to every prison ever, like you ask the person who committed the crime, they'll tell you why they had a reason for it and that it was actually yeah. a good thing to do. And like, we all do bad things, but we think they're good all the time. And that's kind yeah. of a, a way of like your external morality, you're having to kind of turn it on its head. And that's maybe what it's like for everybody is the kind of fucked up thing. Like there's- I've never thought about it in that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Kind of I mean, yes. Mm. There's, yeah, I think we, uh, we justify everything. That, and also I think you often hear people say, I did what I felt was right at the time. Yeah. And whether that's like in the future mm -hmm. that, that, that they realize like that's completely not it. Yep. It's so rare that people make a decision because they want to hurt somebody or they, you know, like yep. I think for the most part, even, uh, like deception or mm. you know anything like that uh, that's what they say like you lie to yourself first and you kind of mm -hmm. yeah it's terrifying man the more i've learned about myself as a person and about like psychology and embodiment and philosophy there's a thing that i talk about sometimes called relevance realization which is basically like how human beings solve the information problem so there's too much information at any one time for us to sort out so Instead, what we do is we cut it down and you reduce it, but you don't do this consciously. So you reduce it by your personality as a way of like filtering the world. But the problem with that, that makes us really adaptive so we can act and live in these complex environments, but it also makes us self-deceptive. So for to right. understand one thing, to have like a heuristic of say, you know, that in this situation, I always do this, that creates a blind spot beside it uh, automatically. So it's like to know something makes you automatically not know something. <laughs> Which is the, the old Socrates Where? buzz. But like, well, yeah, because they, they just say like enlightenment is the final acceptance of being like, I don't know. Just pure like will or willful mm -hmm. ignorance, the opposite of willful awareness of will, it, oh, awareness of ignorance, maybe. But right. um, it, it kind of, yeah, it does. It, it scared the willies out of me anyway, learning it in terms of how much <laughs> like. I just don't know, like, and how much yeah. kind of, you're always like, um, you know, we're so primed to think we know we're so primed mm -hmm. to map everything out, to justify things, like you said, to make stories about people, to make assumptions. And there's mm -hmm. just so much going on that we're just like whoosh, over the head. Completely. 
I think, mm. uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's completely it. And I, th and also we, I mean, we create the story of ourselves yep. constantly. Um, yep. and I think that's, you know, that's one of the satisfying things about acting is you, you get a controlled environment in which to do that and you get to start mm. over again every time. And, mm. um, it's, it's, it's not that unfamiliar of a feeling, I think for, for a lot mm. of people doing that anyway. Mm. Um, but yeah, and it, and I think those stories uh, that we kind of continuously tell about ourselves, or the one the one like thread that we think is is us, or we consider yeah. to be me, mm -hmm. um, I, they're like often pretty limiting. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to uh, like you were saying about about nerves or something like that. Mm -hmm. If I think I spent a long time having made a decision where I was like, I'm not very confident in certain situations. Um, but it was really the, the maybe confidence or whatever, or the, the nerves mm -hmm. that was probably an issue, but then making it part of your identity and calling it something and saying that that's me and, and, and yeah. that, that that's kind of what, what becomes the issue. Like mm. I felt like I, I went skydiving recently and I had like a really clear example Fuck. of that, which was, <laughs> yeah, and that was my biggest fear was, I was like, I just think I'm going to get in the air. And then I'm going to be like, oh man, what? Like, what? is that the time? I really want to do this as well. Like, oh, Did you ever see Peep show where, well. where Mark's doing the bungee jump? He's like, I'm too hungry. You can't make a hungry man jump. It's not right. <laughs> that would probably like, be my excuse. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. But, and like, I think the, then when I got to it, it really, my idea of my own fear was so much bigger than the actual fear was. Um, Whoa. which may be conscious of maybe how little I actually know myself and my reactions to things. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And just that kind of story wasted two days, shit in my pants about something that wasn't <laughs> even scary at the time when I did it. Man, so, I would definitely, yeah. I probably wasted a week or two. <laughs> but that's, there's an interesting thing about fear. Like I kind of tried to figure that out in boxing really where like you'd be going in to mm. spar people and stuff and maybe you've got some guy who's just going to kick the shit out of you and it's going to be like you know it's not going to go so well so yeah. you have that fear but the fear is internal to you it's not his like it's not somebody else's and mm -hmm. that's kind of like where you realize with the skydiving even that it's like the fear is in me it's not in mm -hmm. the although there's plenty to be afraid of there but um i mean i don't know i'd rather that than getting a ring with someone I mean, yeah. this, I was strapped to another man who was actually comforting me. No, I was to beat the shit out of me. <laughs> you know? well, yeah. Maybe I could do boxing if I could have, like, a fellow who was as brave like, as that lad. A guy on the me. back, kind of, like, yeah, throwing jabs just... over the top. Like, um, but there's something you touched on a few seconds ago that I actually wanted to say to you, which is, like, um, something about empathy, about these acting roles building empathy in, like, a real way. Mm -hmm. That makes, do you ever find that then, like you can see reflections yeah. of it in the real world, maybe? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think, um, I, I think there's, I mean, there's something that is inherently satisfying about knowing, going into a conversation and actually knowing what the other person's thinking. There's like a direct line of communication. Um, yeah. and then kind of adding on that the thing you know with empathy is it, most of the most of what you're doing with, with the acting is not sort of cognitive you're not thinking mm -hmm. in words or anything you're kind of just feeling things mm. and when you know what the other pe person is supposed to be feeling and you know exactly what you're supposed to be feeling it's a very kind of satisfying mm -hmm. thing um and i think you'd probably know from doing philosophy as well um, as soon as you have to kind of play the devil's advocate or as soon as you have to go down the rabbit hole and things that you would otherwise dismiss or be like, that's not my viewpoint. I don't agree with that. Yeah. That's, the, I don't agree with that behavior, whatever it is. <clears throat> um, you definitely come away from that with like a new fan perspective. You might not necessarily respect somebody who behaves in say like an abusive way or mm -hmm. anything like that but i think you definitely do gain in an empathetic way you gain like an understanding and a mm -hmm. that's why they behave like that and the motivations or something like yeah. that you can kind yeah. of see the human 
the human side of things. It's something I think that gets lost a lot nowadays, unfortunately. I think social yeah. media kind of inflates it where we're all kind of like just on the other side of a screen or something. So it's not that mm -hmm. real, but like, it's kind of, you can end up in all sorts of messed up positions as a person. It's really like such not a perfect science <laughs> where it's just kind of, yeah. like, just kind of evolved apes doing dumb stuff. But, um, yeah, it just, but that's, I think what, honestly, yeah. the, what, what I loved about the, this show and, and, and like anyone who, who I've been listening to on it and stuff is, uh, that there's not necessarily like a dogmatic, um, approach to any of it. Like, you know, the morality, any of those things, unless we question them ourselves and we, uh, we give space to, to other people to question them, mm. then because without doing that, then we kind of end up with the world that we have a little bit on social media, which is people shouting each other down, yep. um, like virtue, so, you know, all that stuff where really, uh, nobody's, nobody's gaining any more empathy and nobody's learning anything from each other really, because, yeah. um, and you realize, yeah. I suppose how hard empathy is as well. Like something that like going through an experience, like playing a crystal meth dealer and, you know, having to walk in those shoes in a certain sense, you know, most people, you don't really go to that much effort. Like a lot of the time, I think we call empathy just like making up a story about somebody in our head and then deciding that that's who they are without even really realizing it. And there isn't like the kind of theatrical process necessary. Like a guy right. said to me before about writing, that writing is professional empathy. And I was like, what? I was like, and then I kind of thought, and I was like, I guess you are sitting around imagining being other people all the time. And that's something that I just couldn't, I couldn't do that in that capacity mm. as well. That's, I think that's fascinating that you can, because really I focus on one individual at a time, mm -hmm. maybe in a week I'll do a few auditions and stuff, but for the yeah. most part, like I'm, I'm honing in on one person and, and yeah. I'm kind of getting as detailed as possible, mm -hmm. being able to switch like that and, and, and write and have them talk to each other because like, I think yeah. acting <laughs> is relationships, like acting is not mm. me saying something to somebody else. It's what occurs like in the space between everybody that's the most interesting. That's really interesting, the space between people. So in terms of like a relation, because that's what I think is interesting about podcasting is the same mm -hmm. thing. Like I think the conversations themselves are oftentimes just a way of getting something else going. Like I talk about the logos a lot and that kind of like mm -hmm. the interrelationship between people where you can start to feel kind of the conversation takes on a life of its own. And there's probably something like that in acting as well, like kind of a flow that you get yeah. into. I, th I mean, I think flow is like, flow is all of it. Yeah. Um, Are you into flow? Definitely. Like the whole chicks and yeah, well, and... Yes. What's his, is it Mila? Uh, yeah, chicks and I know his last name is chicks and oh, anyway. But chicks and I've never known how to say that. Oh man, I, I only heard it online. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't it looks a lot online. harder to say than <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, it's, like it's not. 14 I, syllables. I didn't learn it through reading, thankfully. But, <laughs> he actually died recently, I think. Um, no way. Yeah, yeah, and he was in oh, his man. 80s. Look, I was but, halfway through. I just I left the book in a pub uh, no a few way. days ago, which is really annoying because I was still at the yeah, sort of shit. like sociological aspect of it and yeah. none of the practical stuff. And I was God, like damn. really looking forward to being like, okay, mm. this sounds great. Now, how do I do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, but I think, that, man, there's so many, so many fascinating things in that, and and mm -hmm. it, it it is uh, like I, before reading it, I would I would always kind of compared the acting experience to like meditating in, mm. in terms of you have to have deep focus, but there can be like no tension in that focus and you, you can't, yeah, you just kind of have to constantly return to, to what it is. Like, you know, if something like uh self-consciousness or, or anything or doubt or yep. anything like that, or what you're going to have for lunch, if that comes into it, you have to re kind of recalibrate. Um, and yet be completely open to anything that's going to happen and, and going to be thrown and responsive you. to it and like yeah in yeah totally in absorbed in the moment but also like prescient enough to and keep lucid doing it. yeah that's so um, interesting the correlation there between this kind of reminds me i don't know if you listened to me and my dad and he was talking about uh, zero in ninjutsu so he's right. been very involved in martial arts but he talks about this in terms of street fighting so he says like when oh, you right. get into a street fight there's like a moment where you can kind of like sabotage yourself before you fight basically. And he says, this is kind of where you win the fight. And he relates it to the logos as well. Like these like three seconds wow. that you can almost get into like the, the flow state, but you initiate it in the fight. 
and then wow. that's how you win in a sense this is kind of like a self-defense thing but he calls it his zero and it's very similar to that where it's like a focus oh. without thinking but also that's aware but not self-reflective but also aware of oneself yeah yeah mm. wow that's that's so sick it's a and crazy it's correlation but no yeah. no but that i mean mm. i it's like that's fascinating and i think anything um i just think like any i feel like there is a thread that runs through every discipline mm -hmm. that i don't fully understand but i think mm. um there is they're sort of not as different um as as they appear on the outside um, yeah and because they, they're all human beings doing them i suppose yeah of, i mean yeah. I guess it's, do yeah, you ever listen exactly. to your man stephen kotler he um the flow genome project oh yes yeah yeah he kind of took I, on chicks and high stuff and like that uh, was I yeah know. i remember signing up i wanted to when i was do i was doing a show in new york and i wanted to uh who was i was listening to <laughs> i was listening to a lot of that. i said jason silver yeah, that lad? He's, he's the, the shots of all. He's the dude. He's like, like, man, you know, the infinite oh reflections of the universe. And, and I'd be there, I was like 19, being like, man, Jesus Christ. This guy rules. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I found out about mushrooms by that point. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's one where he's talking to a baby. Have you ever seen that? Oh my he's God, like, I've seen telling that. telling the baby, he's like, you have been incarnated in the world and you are a being. And the baby's like, oh, what's going on? It's amazing. He's so cool, though. man. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was the first time I kind of heard about flow and then I hadn't, yeah. it, it kind of came back to me. My mom gave me that book and it, it sort of came yeah. back to me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and just the fact that like him talking about the experience of a rock climber, say, or like you say, the experience of your dad street fighting punks on the street. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it was uh, when he told me that, I was like, what? A legend. <laughs> this is fast. How the hell did you figure um, that out? <laughs> but it, yeah, it is. And it, it's definitely, uh, I think what's interesting is, like you say, the, um, the, the defining factor between success and failure in it feels mm. like it comes from a very similar place. Yeah. And that's, that's what's, a, uh, yeah, mm. that's what's, that's what's mad about it. And, and, and you feel it. And I'm sure, like I've done like a little bit of like bouldering and stuff like that, or, or music is definitely something where yep. it just has the same like essence to it. It mm -hmm. feels the same when it's going right. Yep. It feels the same. And I think acting, the thing that's so appealing or that's kind of kept me in is, I don't know if you remember in that book, they have the, the there's like a graph of uh, skills to, um, oh shit, what was it? It basically to stay in the flow state, you're either like anxious and you're out of the flow state or you're bored and like skills versus challenge is on the, yeah. the like Y axis. So when the, Whoa. when your skills increase, the challenge has to increase. Yeah, Otherwise you'll fall get... into boredom. Well, this and is, your skills man, aren't... that is so interesting because there's a big thing, um, like in terms of that meaning being located at the edge of your competence, like where you are, where is meaningful? Like when you're a kid, stuff's really meaningful because you're kind of at odds with everything and then as you get more skilled it becomes boring but then as oh, you really? push out further it becomes meaningful to you again and that this yeah. like flow and meaningful state is kind of at the edge of where you can go that's actually exactly. you know the yin and yang symbol that's what mm -hmm. the s stands for in the middle of it it's like the no border way. between the known and the unknown between chaos and order and then that's oh, where wow. the meaning is it's just oh. yeah crazy <laughs> shit but um, like, i don't know why i was just about to look up to google the yin yang like as if i could like look at it and be like oh there it is jesus <laughs> christ the it's here the whole time <laughs> right under my nose but that one blew my mind remember i can't remember who i heard yeah. i don't know if it was carl Jung talking about it or something but um wow. it's big in alchemy that kind of thing the, the oh, edge yeah. of the known but yeah and it's kind of what I always thought, I mean, I think it's so hard to talk about acting and to, mm. without falling into cliches and, you know, you always hear every actor's like, I just always look for a challenge in my career. You know, I, yeah. I wanna, the next thing I want to do is a challenge. <laughs> and I realize now, like, that's kind of, I mean, for a long time, I was like, fuck a challenge. I was like, it's all too challenging. The whole thing is a challenge. <laughs> I don't need a challenge. And I guess you do it for long enough and it still is like that. But now, mm. like, like doing the, the portable door thing, that was... That was like straight comedy, which is terrifying for me because, really? yeah, just like, I think with drama, if, if, if you, 
if you're doubting yourself or you're not quite sure what to do in the moment, you just you get a little bit quieter and you just kind of be like, you know, I mean, I guess, mm. you know. And then everyone's like, yeah, it's great, it's fine. In comedy, <laughs> like, you've got to, like, double down and be like, well, hey, here you go, here's the... Yeah. And, uh-huh. and, like, the, the, the feedback is so much clearer... Like if it's not funny, like it's just not yep. funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you like know it. right away. Like, yeah, yeah. Kind of, was that the first comedy kind of movie that you've done, or that you? Pretty yeah. much. I mean, it was definitely it was like the first kind of leading. Yeah, yeah, um, and definitely like with the most kind of pressure behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, yeah, it was satisfying. It was like it was, it was a, a challenge, but kind of. Yeah. Felt like, felt like one of those things that, like you say, was just kind of on the edge. It was moving you forward. And I guess yeah. that must get trickier because, like, I mean, you've done so much stuff. Like, I was researching you and um, looking up stuff online and so, and the amount of things that you've been in for such a short space of time, like, going back to, like, 2010, 2011 is, like, you know, you're such an experienced actor at this point. Like, what's your kind of white whale? What's the thing that, you know, oh, shit. what's the fucking... What's Top of the, the mountain. I know. That's the thing. I mean, I don't even know, man. Like, I, I've, I've been finding it's, it's been like a interesting time now. Um, like recently, I've, I've, and I've never really done this before, and it's kind of the scariest thing. But like, been saying no to a couple of things. Yeah. Um, and things that would would pretty make my life a lot more comfortable. Um, but I don't, I don't think I like know what the thing is, but I know that it's, I've not seen it yet. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. I, I, or whatever the, like, the next step is. Um, yep. but in terms of, in terms of really the pinnacle, I think, I think my weaknesses is, are kind of in, uh, mimicry. Like, like mm-hmm. I, I love everything Philip Seymour Hoffman did. Um, and the fact like his performance in Capote, I don't know if you've seen it, but like, yeah. it's so effective. Yeah. yeah it's, it's really, just like, really good. Amazing. And it's like his voice is not what his voice is, all of those things, and yet there's like just pure truth in it. And I think yep. that just from a technical element and all of those things and like gaining mastery over your physicality mm-hmm. and your voice to the point where it becomes unconscious because you can't really give a performance like that that good and be in the driver's seat. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I think he would have drilled it the same way that, uh, you know, like a classical pianist will like learn a piece and learn it so well that they can just sit there and let it happen um that it becomes kind of subconscious like and it just yeah takes place and he was so Um, good in that movie man and such a strange pick because he just doesn't look anything like truman capote at all like (laughs) (laughs) like, not even slightly like there's no No. correlation (laughs) between them Um, and it's gas because now i think of truman capote and i'm like yeah that's him yeah yeah it looks (laughs) like he somehow managed to become him Um, yeah and that's the fascinating challenge isn't it like what's a good enough you know who's a good enough character for that or who's a good enough right I guess as a writer, you kind of have similar things that you have, like maybe stories that you want to tell or something, or that's kind of like, yeah. What's your what? I mean, what, mm. what would your kind of what is it? Magnus Opum? Magnus. <laughs> Magnus is that it? Magnus I, Opium? I think it I is it Magnus Opium? <laughs> I think that's a different thing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Magnum Opus, man. I don't know if I found it yet. To be honest, I have tons of stuff. Like my first stage play should be going on in Belfast now in twenty twenty two. Oh man! In the Mac, no hopefully. Way. That's, I shouldn't Unreal. have said that. That's not supposed to be out there. But anyway. That's funny. You can edit it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it. It's a safe space. But um, so, oh, yeah, man. hopefully that'll I'd love be to on. read it. Man, I, yeah, I'd love to send it to you. And it's just like a good, it's awesome. about like Dublin, really. Very mm-hmm. much in the bones of Dublin and set between the hours of 7 to 10 on a rollover waiting for the AFO based Incredible. on Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Gatto. It's amazing. amazing. It's just like this tragedy, basically, of oh, awful morning. It's, so but, it's just like us after like, I'm not going to say any of the, but after <laughs> yeah, just too, too much been in that situation and, <laughs> numerous times. And philosophizing. Well, <laughs> it gets pretty, it gets pretty Gatto like It certainly <laughs> does, man. That was the car. I mean, I was reading Gatto really hung over and I was like, why is this oh, so familiar man. to me? I was like, this is just like Jesus. what I was doing last night. But that's incredible it's gonna be a lot of fun wow, man. i really I wait to read it just been dying to put it on like because we originally i'd written it in like 2019 and uh we had all the money for it to put it on and then the pandemic happened completely cancelled couldn't do anything oh, like fuck. we got selected for the dublin fringe festival that was cancelled 
couldn't do it there. So it's oh, been a, a bit of a tragic but, saga. But all of those things are kind of amazing anyway, though. That's like that's well, unreal, man. I mean, it's got a bit of a story Jeez. to it at this point. I also got that yeah. monk haircut. I don't know if you saw that on the internet. No. <laughs> oh my god. So you're in it as well? Uh, no, this was part of the fundraising effort. Okay. <laughs> to get the money. So again, well, obviously I didn't give you any money, did I? <laughs> man, uh, I I think it was just for the to get the monk haircut that people funded it. Like they didn't even care right, about the right. prize. <laughs> like, so for the whole of lockdown I had this fucking monk haircut. And like oh I had to go God. shopping in Tesco with it with like a bowl no go in the middle. That's class. Everybody was just like You've lost your mind, man. Jesus, but, that's um, amazing. Well, that's called that's suffering for your art. There you certain, go. Nobody I mean, can... I put my body on the line, like my hair. Hell yeah! I didn't know if it was going to grow back, but um, wow. I, have that, I mean, I have loads of stuff I wanted. Like there was an incident with me yeah. and my dad, which is just like it's when it happened. I was like, this is going to be a movie, and it's going to be mm -hmm. huge, and it's going to be like a fucking classic. Like because we went over to my my uncle died, and we had to go collect his van from France, basically. And me and my dad went over and they were kind of holding it in an impound lot. And we were only supposed to be there for 24 hours. We ended up there for like three and a half days, like missed boats, had tires blow up on the motorway, oh nearly got arrested <laughs> by French police. Like we're like, it just, uh. I, I'm still in therapy from it, to be honest. But like, I was just like, this is ever, everything that went wrong. Like I've never seen anything like it in my life. My dad was like, I don't even know how this is happening. Like oh everything, my God. like the car went, the clutch went, the brakes went, <laughs> the tire blew up. Like we were driving it through France and we couldn't stop. So we had to just drive. And then like my dad was using the handbrake coming up to roundabouts and shit. Oh my God. And you just smell it burn. I was like driving like a big sailing boat and it would just be like leaning around these, man, like Jeez. the van was worth about 600 quid and we end up spending like about say, two and a half still to get it back. <laughs> That's because of uh, all the shenanigans, but oh like, my God. I would love to do that, man, because it was just so yeah. funny and like good father son stuff and like kind of. I love that. Just a bit of spirit to it, but um, yeah, I want to ask you as well. Also, that's like. Oh, sorry. sorry go, for it. go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that. Like, I love stories like that. Like the structure is kind of embedded in it. It's like you've got you've got a very clear, <laughs> simple task. You're, You're like, gonna get from A to B. Don't fuck it up. Just get it right. Yeah. It'll be fine. <laughs> I know, yeah. but I was going to ask you because your dad's an actor as well, isn't it? Something, yeah, a frequent topic of the podcast for some reason that comes up is dads, dads, and people. Yeah, um, one of the guys, Tag Beckett, who's an artist, his dad was an uh -huh. actor and like really inspired him, you know, eating razor blades and doing like, yeah, escapism on the Pat Kenny show and stuff. I wonder, did it was that so funny you? when I listened to that. Oh, did you hear it? Uh, Man, outrageous yeah, yeah, story. Was, like, I know, I know, and you know, I, I used to do a lot of magic when I was a kid, which is yeah, also Yeah, I weird. remember. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're, like, oh, you're that weird fucker doing magic <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> well, man, it fucking worked out, man. You do more. I mean, it's fucking, apparently it does the job. But yeah, it was, It was. Uh, I think my, my dad being an actor, it's kind of one of those things where you, I think when, when I was younger, I was like, you know, there's not really much correlation between those two things. I, it was, I definitely got into it because... I think he had like an agent in Ireland and obviously that's like I was gr living there and growing up there hmm. and uh, they just kind of put me on the books being like, yeah, sure. If anything comes up for a kid um, Sorry, yeah. and then I did like a Vodafone ad <laughs> and like a few, you know, like a few like little things. <laughs> um, but I think definitely I used to spend summers when I was probably like nine to like 12 or 13 um, in this place in Southwold uh this like summer theater in in the uk and i remember just like hanging out with all these like actors and and actresses who were just so much crack and there was yeah. like so much love as well between all the people and and like they, i don't know they treated me like i was like 30 you know there was no, <laughs> yeah. it was mad it was like my first experience of, like i was like wow this is nuts there's like, uh, no rules Sweet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I drank them all under the table. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> typical English, you know what I mean? <laughs> One Irish child. Yeah. Um but yeah, I think that, that definitely had a had a bearing on it. And um and he was also yeah, always just always like very supportive and, and so was my mum in, in terms of going out and doing probably the least responsible or one of them jobs you can do. <laughs> yeah, man, child actor. I mean, the, usually the results can be, 
you know, yeah. tenuous, like, but it seems like you kind of got into it for the right reasons, like, and that you were, you know, maybe not like yeah. in a weird position where you're one of those kids that gets like driven up, thrown in somewhere to like, you know, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that. No, would that was the thing. It was effect. a nice balance of like, cause I remember when I was like 14, I was like, Oh no, I never want to do this again. Not really into it. Don't like doing the auditions and stuff. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, grand. And then when I wanted to start again, they're like, yeah, go on, go for it. You know, so it was, that was, that was nice to never feel like I had to do it for anyone else's approval or anything like that. Yeah. Um, that's really good, man. It reminds me of, I was thinking of, did you ever see in uh, Bruno when they have all the, the Sasha Baron Cohen oh one? When he has a, <laughs> yeah. and he's like, is your child okay with bees? <laughs> he's like, oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He's like, what about heavy machinery? <laughs> It's like talking about giving them liposuction and everything. You're like, oh my God, this is like next yeah. level. But That's yeah. Mm. Um, but no, thankfully they were, they were very supportive. And my dad, you know, he, he would like do audition tapes with me and stuff. And cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of like shit that you do behind the scenes that it kind of on the surface looks like, you know, a pretty glamorous job. And there's definitely some huge perks and you, mm. most of the time you get, you know, to spend your time the way you want to. I think that's one of the most valuable things about it to me is that apart from when you're on four months on a shoot and you're working six day weeks, you're when you're off, you, yeah, you're pretty off and you get to mm -hmm. like my day kind of revolves around waking up and working on a character, working on auditions for a scene, but it's kind of, yeah, there's, there's like a lot of freedom in it. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the other hand, it's like a, brutal industry it can it's be brutal and yeah and, and it's uh, you know very intense and very like there's a lot that comes along with it i suppose but yeah also i mean the perks are you know yeah you, yeah if you're good at it and, and you, you get to travel and travel and, um yeah i remember i think the when i did a when i did the play that that's when i was like this is that it was like one of the most intense because i was doing an audiobook at the same time so i'd like go oh nice from yeah, and this is like six months. Audiobooks um, are rough, man. I did some recordings of them before, and did. it's like exhausting. Yeah, yeah. It would. I mean, that was, and I was just like talking nonstop. It was. Um, so I didn't really know what I was getting into. I remember I was, I was like in the dressing room. I just booked a holiday to Ibiza, um, and I was like, my agent was like, "Oh, do you want to do this audiobook?" And I was like, "Yeah, great. Like, do two jobs at once." And then go on holiday. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then, so I agreed to send it through. And then she's like, yeah, it's for Ulysses. James Joyce's oh, Ulysses. Oh, for fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And I was like, I was like, wow. yeah, great. No, no worries. I've definitely heard of it. I've heard it's a, you know, it's a bit of a read or whatever. Now, I'm not really a big reader either. I mean, I try that to is... a little bit more now, but was not, I mean, I couldn't even read the fucking Harry Potter <laughs> books when I was growing up. So this was, I don't know who signed me up for it or like what, God, but it was, that's like it was a practical joke. Book. Like it's, you were being no, yeah, it was, by somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like a joke that became like a lot less funny every day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, did you enjoy it? Like, did you get into the old Ulysses? I did. I, I, uh, first, I think I had two weeks to prep it mm -hmm. and, um, and then I think it was 10 sessions to record it in or something maybe Man, more maybe it turned into like 15 because like there it's a big book like it's about yeah it was it was 80 seven. pages a day i think and we did the like the edited version is 36 hours um Man. but i don't know I, it was mental i don't know why your they vocal like, cords must be like ripped after yeah. that like <laughs> that's fully i mean so much. i remember because it was just me and a producer and, and thankfully she was in i mean incredibly uh bright and and um and newer stuff but i was kind of like I'd, I'd prep you'd have you'd have to read it before you went in so i prepped yeah. the 80 pages before each session and then <laughs> we're just um, like what the fuck tried, is going on yeah like, be like hey spark nuts <laughs> <laughs> what is this Man. but i also made the mistake of the first day um i even still remember like the opening of it i was like come up can't you fear from jesuit <laughs> Up here now, up this day. And, and I did like a voice for all of them. And I was like, Stephen Dedalus. By the end of it, I was like, fuck, I should not have done any different voices. <laughs> I was like losing my mind. I'd literally be on the bus um, and I'd be like, oh, that person has a voice that I've not really done. I'll try and put that in. Because <laughs> well, I literally would run out of people and then they'd all start talking to each other. 
and I have to make like voice notes to myself of like who that person Which is. Which really voice? Really... And there's so many people. Man, this is Man, such a nerdy inside. It's such a nerdy story to be in on. But like, for, from, <laughs> the, no, from having read Ulysses and having tried to narrate oh God, audiobooks yeah. before, like that is just outrageous. Right. Like, so how did you find it? That's um, I can't believe mm. uh, that's amazing that you've. I read you know? it. Yeah, I mean James Joyce is my favorite writer. Him and Hemingway right. are like, I mean, I like his other books more, to be honest. Like, Dubliners uh -huh. is like just Dubliners fucking is amazing. beautiful, man. Ulysses so they gave that one to Andrew Scott, because they knew now <laughs> fucking listen to mine. Damn it, Andrew. <laughs> was, he got the soft deal on it. But <laughs> Ulysses, like, I I kind of, I read Ulysses just to say I'd read Ulysses and just like to get it done. And right. Like, fair enough. And some bits of it, you're like, this is like either the most oh. genius thing I've ever read in my entire life. Yeah. And I'm just too dumb and I don't get it. Yeah. And the whole like, put what is it if it's a gate or if you can put five fingers through it it's a gate if you mm -hmm. can't it's a door and like just yeah. this crazy poetry that was just like yeah mad. and then other bits are just like what is he talking about like apparently when I he know. was writing it he'd like write letters to people to be like can you describe the ground outside of your mother's shed from no like way. The, he did, just did he was obsessed with it like because he was going blind yeah. as well when he was writing it like he was yeah and um it wasn't particularly, I mean, it was, I think it was kind of well received, but like, it was a long shot. Like he was really yeah, putting a lot on the line. A lot of people just didn't get it. A lot of people were like, fuck. I don't know if you've seen Finnegan's Wake, the book he wrote after it. I couldn't even get like, begin to, to uh, like, no. I read the first like three pages. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck yeah. is this? Like, <laughs> it's too, like, it's too much. I mean, there's, cause that's uh, what I found with Ulysses was like, it was, um, and I, I don't know if I would have been able to do it without uh, kind of reading people's analysis of each chapter as well while yeah. I was doing it. Because that, that you have definitely... to understand the story as well, don't you, to kind of yeah. play the characters. Like, that's... Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. Like, when you're reading it out loud, you kind of... If you don't understand it, it, it you can hear that someone's just saying the words. And, and like, yeah. there was points that were, like, impenetrable. So you just kind of had to just fucking say it just, <laughs> just like try and make it like quick enough that like Man, people I'm will so glad we stumbled into this this is like a, my favourite anecdote that I've had in the podcast like this man you should get a black belt in something for having to go through that like <laughs> but it's funny it's, I mean, it's there it's just like it's um yeah it's the, it's like the penguin one as well which is which is mad but I don't know I, I don't know if like many people have listened to it I, yeah like, but I remember when we did the final um you know like Molly Bloom's Kind of monologue, yeah, which is incredible. Like which it's is, so that, like, man. I'm like, oh, sorry, cover. Yeah, you know that's all um, while he's getting a hand job on the beach in like Brita's yep, or something. Yep, yep. And he's like, man, that. I mean, that Jesus Christ, that scene was. Uh, that's nuts. He's looking over. What is her name, Gertie? And uh, and I was like, oh, what's the fireworks about? Ah, that's he's 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 not. <laughs> <He's masked. laughs> But it's so oh, beautifully see. written and He's so. A wank. Yeah, it, but it is no, just exactly. like a, a a really like fifteen twenty page wank joke basically. Yeah, like, yeah, and and jokes. it's um because every chapter is like a different uh, uh like literary style, and that yeah. one he's he's parodying the kind of I guess what now would be like YA fiction, like yeah. the kind of the like teen romance <laughs> novels. Which is like just another layer, layer of. Man, I didn't even fucking... get that. Like I was just like, yeah. I don't. Yeah. And it, the interesting. I, mean, I guess if you haven't read like nineteen fifties like <laughs> YA novels, Victorian <laughs> love letters. Like, but yeah. he, um, the interesting, yeah, he that one he was trying to make like capture a day in Dublin as well. I know he based mm -hmm. it obviously on Ulysses and that it has this yeah. kind of universal thing. But Joyce is really into that where it was like the the objective and the subjective, like trying to get the mythological from. Mm the individual absolutely in like the most benign place ever which was dublin for yeah him. um like it feels like a really desperate attempt to put on paper what what it feels like to be alive and what it like in this very moment like what it feels like <laughs> now that like the thing that is like intangible you can't really hold on to it or, or or get it and he i don't know like with language he's trying to do it and it 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 fail like it doesn't he can't and, and i feel like that's why it's so annoying at points because he he goes into like pomposity and like 15 pages on something that's like fucking irrelevant because yeah, he's like trying to show it i mean I, like the last chapter was like the only thing that kind of really that i was like okay this is worth all of this ordeal <laughs> all of when, this when misery this, and suffering yeah. to get to this well, i literally i mean the last chapter i the 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 like um, Molly Bloom one where she's where she's in bed and like you say he's he's having a, getting a tug and uh, in Brittis or whatever he um 
it's it's like unpunctuated, obviously, and it's like all her. Yeah, and I tried to do it in one go, and I passed out <laughs> in the booth because I couldn't take breaths enough. <laughs> Oh my god, like, like this is yeah. man, <laughs> anybody who wants to be an actor, this is what happens like this is, like that is so intense, man. You know um, Carl Jung read it yeah. and he wrote a letter. Him and Joyce were kind of because James Joyce's daughter had schizophrenia. Yes. She yeah. tried to get he tried to get um Jung to treat her. But oh, wow. Jung had read it and he's there's a book review out there if people are interested of Carl no. Jung reviewing Ulysses just basically saying, what the fuck is this? <laughs> he's like, oh my God. He's like, I'm a supposedly sane psychiatrist and this melted my brain. You oh are. wow, that's amazing. It's, it's pretty cool, weird correlation, but. Um, oh my God, I gotta find that. Yeah, it's a, and have you ever read James Joyce's love letters there, man? Oh yeah. They're rough. Yeah, <laughs> he's into some, I oh know, he's into some real shit. <laughs> some crazy <laughs> stuff, man. which is always funny because you think wow. of people from history as being all like, I don't know, well buttoned down and mannerly Completely. and stuff, but Joyce wasn't, man. No, he there was... was there was some real, real like mad shit. I almost feel like I was, someone was talking about this to me the other day. Like I, I don't wonder like have we become more conservative, even though mm. even though like on the surface you know we have kind of I guess you know n nothing against the Kardashians or whatever, but you know we yeah. we we become like on the surface quite like a hyper sexualized society, mm. and yet I don't get the sense from many of my mates. I mean, like, I know, like, n no one's, you know, th th there's not like a sexual liberation that feels like it's uh, reflected by what's actually kind of... Like... Yeah, and that kind of like, I, maybe that it's all kind of like tucked away or kind of like, hmm. I suppose it would have been in his time as well, but like, there seemed to be a real, reading those love letters, you're like, man, this dude's a fucking, <laughs> like, this is... Yeah! Wild was... shit. Like, he's, like, dying for this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's mad. It's mad. Like, he's, yeah, yeah he's got his, he's got his thing as well he's after. <laughs> I, I don't know. We're also, like, speaking in code, because it's just, yeah, like, so Yeah, I mean, weird, look it but... up. I don't know if this is PG-13. <laughs> you can find it for yourself out there. But, um, <laughs> but I think that's, and something you hit on there, the, like, the stream of consciousness, the, like, trying to find out what it, what it was like to be a human being at that yeah. time. That's so fascinating to me. Like that's the whole yeah. reason I got into writing was to try and do that, to try and like wow. just communicate what it's like to be a person at like a certain period of time and make sense of it. And I, I feel like with technology and stuff, that's going to get even weirder, man. I'm working on this, the metaverse thing at the moment, mm. uh, doing some like content writing, copywriting for uh, this conference called enter the metaverse, which people oh, can man. check out. That's going to be cool. But like, the possibilities with that are like, like you could use AI to crunch all of James Joyce and then create like an avatar of him. And we'll probably just be able to talk to him at some point and ask him like, what was going on? Like, what was, yeah, <laughs> what was up with that? Like, oh, man. things are getting That's so crazy. weird. Like, they really are. <laughs> and I think we're, we're, we're so much closer to the, the edge of, I mean, do you know that mm -hmm. Ray Kurzweil singularity is near? Yep. That's, uh, I think that was like a big Jason Silva thing as well. And, mm. and he was, I mean, he wrote that, what, like 10, 20 years ago, maybe. Mm. Um, and a lot of, a lot of the stuff is, has kind of come true. Like, I think, yep. I don't know how, how big do you think the, uh, like the Zuckerberg announcement was? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, I mean, it's massive really, isn't it? Like, I yeah. don't know how much of it is to deflect away from the bad press they've been having with like the right. Facebook files and the whistleblower and stuff. But also, I mean, the metaverse thing, like the more I learn about it, the more I'm just like, holy shit, this is going to be yeah. like the new, like, I think the iPhone was big. This is going to be yeah. way bigger than that. Like, cause it's, yeah, it's not going to be just as simple as like a kind of a virtual world that people go into. Like it'll have its own economy and it will have like the ability to own property, like NFTs and cryptocurrencies and you mm -hmm. interact with it and earn a living and you'll have like, you know, there's the possibilities of it are so strange, man, that the I mean, next I'm okay years, with it as long as it <laughs> yeah. doesn't leave you with that sort of like yeah. numb, empty void feeling that you have after you existential scroll social media. Dread, yeah. like, well, that's yeah. it. That's the problem with VR, man, because it, it gives people existential it, dread after a period oh, of time. Oh, man. I had to stop. I had, really? I had like one of the Oculus Go's and yeah. it just... Uh, no way. It, it, it also is just like too intense, like fighting zombies on it. Like, yeah. that's where you're really fighting zombies. <laughs> like you really feel like you're, you're like sympathetic like nervous or whatever that is. Like, 
Yeah, it is. It's, That's a good it, point, it, man. It's I mad. Thought I, of that. I mean, I feel the same way about. I remember, like somebody, somebody booked uh, tickets to a 4D movie the other day, yeah. and it was one of the worst experiences of. <laughs> <laughs> Not just because I was hung over for it. It was like yeah. it, was, it was bad. Like right. you, when somebody gets punched. You get like punched in the back <laughs> uh, when That's when there's so like shit. Like it's who came so up with stupid. It? Like, no, and it's it it's not immersive either. Like it doesn't make you feel like whoa. Like I'm really in the action. Like when water, you know, when you're in like a water yeah, scene, it splashes like, you with water. You. Yeah, yeah it, it, man, it's it's terrible. You just like, I don't know if that's like, quite what 4D and... is either. Like, I, don't I know, know if that's like yeah. that's <laughs> kind of overselling. Like it's got it like a bit. scratchy pad and a smelly rubber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you can smell the movie, and that's like, man, it's funny. I did that yeah. before this podcast. I put on deodorant. I was like, what am I doing? It's a fucking podcast. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I always do that. Like, brush my teeth before a podcast. I'm like, what am I fucking? What's the point of this? But like, it makes you feel good. Like, you go in, you're like, you know what? I'm ready. It makes it, yeah, okay, I can do this now. But that's, I should have done the same With the I'm Oculus spending. that you had, so it was one of the VR ones, like the glasses and then kind of like controllers. Yeah. See, what they're talking about now, I mean, there was those Google glasses. What I've been looking yeah. at with the, the latest Facebook stuff is like similar to the Google glasses type thing, but it's like you can see the world, but then the virtual world is overlaid on it. Right, so it's right. like Google Maps, but you'd see in front of you like a red line yeah. and you'd follow that red line. And like yeah. you'd be able, it's like Pokemon Go kind of, but another kind of layer of it where you'll have, you know, you could just have your digital display. You'd be in your Google Docs and you'll just press stuff and you'll say things. If you want to type mm -hmm. something, you'll just speak out loud. Like you wouldn't need hardware anymore. Like screens yes. and stuff would become outdated, basically. I, I, it's just like, what, mm. it's mad that there's not uh, such kind of public conversations about, uh, the morality of, like you know or like just like yeah. the the rules of it like where do we go i mean <laughs> i'm yeah. sure it's not going to be like that black mirror episode but you know if you can see somebody's social media following when yeah. they're walking down the street that takes away there's it, there's just like such a danger in in the yeah. value system that we've been placing on people in terms of that and then having yeah. that be like instantly accessible always um, and how terrifying. the basis of our i mean we haven't really thought about that like that's the other work i've been doing with uh, tcu on the ethics of social media companies monetizing mm -hmm. attention and like the problems that that's caused is just we have no idea what that's done to particularly younger people like our generation we kind of mm -hmm. just missed it maybe but people who have grown up in that world that's their value system and it's been made yeah. to sell them things <laughs> like, I mean, it feels like, yeah, like, like we're, we're kind of the generation that when we were like, you know, 20, someone's like, Hey man, you want to try this? <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, it's man. really good. And you're like, <laughs> you know, we spend our lives kind of being like, Oh fuck, I got back on it. But, no, it's fine. I'll get back. <laughs> These kids have just been mainlining it. Honestly, their they're entire like life. crack babies. Like we really yeah. did not think that one through no. at all. And sure that was big Zuck. Like, so yeah. I don't know. Watching that metaverse thing, man, I was in two minds about it because I think the metaverse thing is really, really interesting, but also mm -hmm. I think he's doing it as a way of just being the first one through the door. Like Facebook yeah. will have the most real estate to take that over. And then they just, they're kind of the authority of the metaverse because yeah. if it's web three and it's decentralized, there won't be an authority like that. It'll be built by the people that use it basically. So whoever's in the community builds it and that's right. kind of the arms race that's happening. I wow. Think. Do you think that's a more like it would be it would be kind of a more optimistic future for us? Yeah, it seems more democratic anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the problem with Web 2.0 at the moment is the gatekeepers, Google and Facebook mm -hmm. kind of run everything. You have this the issues of privacy, people being the you know, that we're the product rather than the user. And Web 3.0 seems to solve a lot of those. It's still, I think, too complex for people. I think there's like 10 million people or something with wallets for like right. cryptocurrencies and stuff. So it hasn't really gone fully mainstream, but there's a lot of interest in being like, do you know, Naval Ravikant, the angel investor? Um, he, there's so many memes wow. with him and like always his quotes are posted everywhere. Okay. I think he's on is Rogan he, he, as well. Oh, is he responsible for like a coin or anything? No. Yeah, I think there is actually a Naval coin, but um, he's this kind of like Silicon oh, right. Valley philosopher. But oh, wow. he did a podcast with Tim Ferriss recently on it that was really good. Mm -hmm. And another guy, Chris Dixon, where he's just like, this is the 
this thing is happening right now and this is the thing like this is going to be this is right. going to make the other revolutions look like you know warm ups <laughs> basically um wow. and the big issue seems to be like government interference or like you know nobody just nobody really understands it yet it's still kind of no. ongoing but yeah, the whole of the internet so far could just be a warm up for what the hell is going to come next, which is. I mean, I'm not surprised. It's funny that we're always surprised. Like every time, yeah. we always think we're at the pinnacle. We think we're there, yeah. and then we look back and laugh at like what people thought. You know, like you look <laughs> yeah. at the fax machine. You're like, <laughs> you fucking idiot. You thought yeah, that yeah. was cool, like, <laughs> but, you know, like I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Like we're looking at this sort of, yeah. like, two D text based thing yeah. that you've got to scroll, mm. like. It actually, it, like when you put it into the perspective of something like the metaverse, yeah. I can totally imagine my kids being like, <laughs> and when I'm like, no, seriously, that was the, that, the iPhone 13? That was like the height of the shit. That was that awesome. Was it, man. And they're like yeah, making They're going to have like, like stranger oh. things. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have like nostalgic TV shows if you were like, whoa, look at that. Hey. People on iPhones. That's going to be, that will be too yeah. old by then. That'll be when you're just like, man, I know. I have, I've I know. outlived this whole thing. Like, <laughs> yeah. Fucking Good. ancient. <laughs> yeah man it's a weird world and the more i'm learning about it the more i'm like what is gonna happen like there's oh well i'm i'm, I'm, I'm glad to have this uh this podcast and, and a couple of others to to keep up to date because i could not be doing the research myself but this man thanks for doing it that's the third party information let the buyer beware okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put all my money in the metaverse it's shit <laughs> Don't do Man it. Man told me. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be <laughs> it was big. A sure thing. Like fucking salesman for the metaverse. But um, <laughs> I do genuinely, I mean, there's, it's still kind of probably in the stage where it's like stuff's going to happen so much. So like the first people are going to be like, probably not work out and then right. the next ones and so on. Have you heard of like the play to earn model? Like yes. Axie Infinity yes. and. And that's kind of going already, right? In, in that's some... got, people are earning livings playing these video yeah. games. Like, now I've got a friend uh, who's just like next level genius developer, mm -hmm. um, and he is kind of one of the only people at the moment making NFTs that are playable. Oh, uh, and I'm so yeah, and he's he, I mean he's got a whole game. I mean you should oh. chat to this guy. He's he's that is sick, amazing, man. I'll have to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's kind of like ahead of the curve in terms of that, and I think mm -hmm. that's that's the only way it's going to go. Uh, I think in you know and mm -hmm. when they become usable like you say like in the metaverse when you can actually yeah. flex with your i don't know stupid like sixty thousand dollar <laughs> piece of art 25 million dollar monkey picture yeah yeah <laughs> you're like oh he's a baller <laughs> this guy is big bucks but that's so interesting that a playable nft because that's what your man yeah. Naval was saying that technically i mean you look at it as a jpeg or something but it's it's just as functional as a website like it can be built on and right. it can be developed but you own the property rights like it's mm -hmm. it basically owning it's a piece that, of the internet yeah because because mm -hmm. second life kind of did that right like do you remember that yeah this guy that was that philip, weird. philip rosedale was the guy that did it um ah. he's actually speaking at this conference the enter the metaverse right. one um, no way. So I'm very excited to hear from him because um, he's still wow. doing stuff. Like he's still working on the metaverse after the Second that's Life crazy. thing. Because um, I don't know if that's still got. I'm sure there's some like I think niche it's people still using it, but still hanging on as far as yeah. I know. But I don't know if it's. I super... mean, I knew a guy who literally made. He was a magician, but he made yeah. like all his money selling sex toys on it. <laughs> really? <laughs> like virtual? Yeah. <laughs> what? Um, and he was making a killing. Dude, <laughs> that's was... like, you know, your parents tell you not to do these things, but the jobs nowadays are going to get real weird. Like, you gotta, I know. You got to do I something know. like collect JPEGs, <laughs> sell them online for 20 million. Like, it's crazy. You know, actually, one of the drivers on uh, the last film I did, he was he was really into crypto and we'd like talk about it to and from work. And he wanted to, and I've just seen that they're now doing it. So I guess I'm yeah. not giving away his idea, but mm -hmm. he wanted to do a whole film that was kind of, funded by crypto but then like each scene is an nft um oh, and you what? can because tarantino's selling uncut uh scenes from pulp fiction as nfts um, and there was the nba thing where you could like buy yeah. the shots like you get like you know a slam dunk from michael jordan like, is, like, what worth... does that mean like <laughs> how, no, you, like, how can you own that? i own this Mi yeah. michael jordan slam dunk from like it's mad that desire to to 
to mm-hmm. have ownership over things like that. Like I think that's a real product of yeah. where we've come in in society, and we've been told for long enough. I can't remember who I was, who was talking about like the cult of individuality. Mm. Like we we saw ourselves as more of a society, apparently, like in kind of the fifties and stuff. And then yeah. because of advertising, it, it was much easier to sell people things when you sort of made them you you place more value on their individuality. Yep. And like, you know, this is mm-hmm. how you express your individuality. Like you buy more of the shit, and you, yep. <laughs> whatever it is. Yep. And, uh, and yeah, just, just the fact that like now it's come to a point where it's like, I want to own that. I don't want to just experience it. I don't want to like watch it and enjoy it with other people. I want to own it. And when I you ask who owns that, I'm like, it's me. <laughs> it's, it's me, bro. And I paid 11 stupid. million for it and I don't yeah. regret anything. You're like, but that's it. I mean, it's either going to go one way or the other. It's either going to be like, those people are so far ahead of the curve and they inherit the earth or they've done the dumbest thing ever and nobody's going to care. And you're going to be like, dude, you made some bad investment moves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I really can't tell at this point what it's going to no, be. It feels, it, it feels like it's all on that kind of, uh, that, that tipping point, right? Like it's just the deciding time, even in terms of crypto and stuff, I feel like it's, yeah. um, fluctuating up and down. And like, <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. We'll make this podcast an NFT anyway. We'll sell it. Good. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Invest now. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. bye. They're going to be huge. 25 million. But I just, <laughs> yeah, man. This has been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate it, Paddy. It's been Thank great, you. man. Thanks thanks so much for, for having us. And uh, um, what's next for you? What's the portable door? So, yeah. So next, yeah. So there's uh, next year, there's going to be the two films coming out that the one uh in la we finally got to finish in march this year yeah um and it was that was probably the most like exciting shoot just like creatively that that i've been involved in um and i think that's going to be january next year that that's coming out and then portable door kind of midway through next year um and then yeah there's a few things that like working on but i don't know if i'm allowed to say them yet if it's all street legal but yeah. man, I, I really hope we can do this again sometime. This has been definitely yeah. so much crack, and and I'll keep uh, listening. Thanks for thanks for having man, me, man. Really appreciate, appreciate it, brother. And uh, keep facing that fear. <laughs> Hell yeah! Hell yeah, brother! Keep that flow Woo! going. This is no budget, Joe Rogan. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I know they can't see, but I'm about.